What is pericarditis? How do we diagnose it? What causes it? And how do we treat it? These are some of the things that I'm going to be reviewing in this video about pericarditis. Pericarditis is inflammation of the connective tissue pericardial sac that surrounds the heart. Day to day, most people don't realize that they even have a pericardium, but when it gets inflamed, it can cause a lot of symptoms that can be quite concerning. There are two layers of the pericardium. There's the visceral pericardium that surrounds the heart and then the parietal pericardium. In between those two layers is normally about 15 to 50 milliliters of physiologic fluid that helps kind of lubricate it so that we don't even notice it. When there's inflammation of the pericardium, those two layers rub against each other and can cause the symptoms that are associated with pericarditis. The symptoms that are associated with pericarditis is typically a stabbing sharp chest pain. Classically, it's worse when people lay down or take a deep breath. The reason for that is because it creates more friction between those two layers of the pericardium. That's also why classically people will get relief of their symptoms when they sit up and lean forward because it gives a little bit of alleviation and separation of those two layers. The most common etiologies of pericarditis is idiopathic. Idiopathic simply meaning that we don't know. Now the second most common cause, which are kind of sometimes lump into idiopathic, is viral causes. Any number of viruses can cause pericarditis. It happens with the flu, Coxsackie B virus, mumps, herpes. It can even happen with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Really, any virus probably can cause it. The reason that we often end up calling it idiopathic, even though maybe a lot of them are viral causes, is that we don't end up sending every single test for every single virus in the world. And the reason for that is because the treatment remains the same. There are a lot of other more rare causes of pericarditis that clinicians have to be aware of. Things like autoimmune disorders like lupus, infections, specifically tuberculosis and other bacteria, uremia due to kidney failure, and even cancer. There are also a few acute causes that clinicians have to be aware of. Things that can be immediately life-threatening and cause pericarditis as a complication of it. Things like an acute chest wall trauma, aortic dissection, or with an acute myocardial infarction or heart attack. Now as a side note, if you have classic pericarditis, but there's an elevated troponin or positive biomarkers indicating damage to the muscle of the heart itself, then we simply call it myopericarditis. I'm not going to cover that in detail in this video. But classically, in pericarditis, the muscle of the heart is not affected. So how do we diagnose pericarditis? I think this is a great example of the importance of a good history and physical. In order to diagnose pericarditis, you need two of the following four diagnostic criteria. You need the classic symptoms of the typical chest pain of pericarditis, the ones that we discussed earlier, where it's worse when you lay down, take a deep breath, better when you sit up or lean forward. Number two, classic EKG changes consistent with pericarditis. Number three, a new or worsening pericardial effusion. And number four, if you hear it, a pericardial friction rub. And we often also get ESR and CRP or erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive proteins. Those are inflammatory markers that are very nonspecific, but we commonly see elevations in them in pericarditis. And we'll get to the use of CRP as an outpatient later on in the video when we talk about treatment. Now let's focus on the EKG for the medical trainees. In classic pericarditis, the EKG changes are PR depression along with ST elevations. You want to look at the TP segment, the end of the T wave to the beginning of the P wave, to compare the PR depression and ST elevations to, because that's the true isoelectric point in the EKG where the heart's just chilling. And these ST elevations are gonna be diffuse. It won't follow a classic coronary distribution. Whenever you have a heart attack, normally you'll see ST elevations in leads that are consistent with a specific territory. Inferior leads like 2, 3, and AVF, lateral leads like 1, AVL, V5, V6, or anterior leads like V1 through V4, or anterolateral with a combination of those. In pericarditis, you can have diffuse ST elevations, and it simply won't make sense for a patient to be having three STEMIs at the same time. Uh, it's probably possible, but Occam's razor teaches us that the simplest explanation is the most likely one. Another clue that tells you this is pericarditis is that if you're looking at an EKG and there's ST elevations, and you're thinking that it's a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, you typically will see reciprocal ST depressions in other leads. In pericarditis, you don't see this. Now, if you're ever rounding with me in the hospital, you know that I'm gonna ask what is the most specific EKG finding consistent with pericarditis, and that is PR elevation in lead AVR. And you should also see ST depressions in AVR, but that PR elevation is really what you wanna look for. So how do we treat pericarditis? You have a patient, you diagnosed them, what is the first medication that you're gonna be giving them? The two meds that I always start people on 
is NSAIDs, some type of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, and colchicine. NSAIDs, like ibuprofen, we typically dose six to 800 milligrams three times a day. For colchicine, you normally start with a loading dose of 1.2 milligrams and then switch to 0.6 milligrams twice a day. I normally think of it as one month, three month. You wanna use NSAIDs for about a month. Sometimes you can decrease that depending on the patient's symptoms and sometimes it's a little bit patient dependent, but the colchicine you generally wanna give for about three months. Now this is probably the most important part of the video. When we treat patients for pericarditis, we want to prevent the recurrence of pericarditis because every single time a patient has another bout of pericarditis, whether it's another infection or unfortunately a lack of appropriate treatment, it becomes tougher and tougher to treat and it increases the chance that you can have constrictive pericarditis. Every single time a patient has pericarditis, that pericardium gets a little bit more thick and eventually can actually get adherent to the heart. And when it becomes adherent to the heart, the last treatment that we have is pericardial stripping, and it's as barbaric as it sounds. Cardiothoracic surgeons have to take a patient, perform open heart surgery, and literally peel away the pericardium from the heart itself. It's a very challenging procedure. Surgeons don't like to do it, and it can be very dangerous. We have to do it for certain patients when it's causing them severe heart failure symptoms, but the good thing about the treatment of pericarditis is we can hopefully prevent that from ever having to be a conversation if we educate our patients appropriately about the treatment that we're gonna give them. So first, for NSAIDs, we have to use the appropriate ones. I normally use ibuprofen six to 800 three times a day. And one of the side effects, unfortunately, with the high doses of ibuprofen is gonna be possible gastritis or GI intolerance. Their stomach's not gonna feel great. Stomachs don't like NSAIDs. So I routinely will use a low dose of a PPI, a proton pump inhibitor, like omeprazole or pantoprazole, 20 milligrams. I won't use the full dose. And eventually, as an outpatient, when we stop the NSAIDs, I also stop that PPI. Now the NSAIDs are gonna both treat the symptoms, it's gonna make them not have that chest discomfort, and it's also gonna help with the inflammation. You have to remind patients that you don't wanna stop the NSAIDs just because you're feeling better. Is that you have to remind patients that the NSAIDs are gonna make them feel better. It's gonna get rid of some of that inflammation and make them feel better but we still have to continue colchicine for about three months. Again, the reason for that is because we need to continue to allow the healing process to occur and decrease inflammation and decrease possible long-term complications of pericarditis. The NSAIDs are the short-term answer and it helps with the inflammation, but the colchicine is the true key to preventing long-term complications. It's been reported that about 70 to 80% of patients might appropriately be able to be treated with NSAIDs alone, but I don't think it's worth the risk to not treat with colchicine and frankly, it's standard of care. When you treat with colchicine, you wanna start with a 1.2 milligram loading dose and then go to 0.6 milligrams twice a day. I always tell patients to be wary of possible diarrhea. That's a common side effect with high doses of colchicine and we can work with them to lower the dose. Both the NSAIDs and the colchicine are started out as a very high dose at a very high frequency. But if they're recovering well and doing well outside the hospital, we can certainly decrease the dose and that's what we do. We don't keep them on this same dose for three straight months. We will slowly taper those medications off. So it's not a lifelong medication, but it's very important in the short term. There are two other caveats that I'll mention about the medications we use to treat pericarditis in the routine manner. First, it's that if a patient has coronary artery disease, ibuprofen, Motrin, naproxen, NSAIDs in general are contraindicated. So in those patients, you wanna use high doses of aspirin. Second important thing is prednisone should never be a first-line therapy. Using prednisone or steroids in isolation for the treatment of pericarditis increases the risk of recurrent pericarditis a lot. Prednisone should only be used in cases where NSAIDs and colchicine have direct contraindications or patients have failed them, and that's kind of what you're stuck using. But it should never be used alone, and if you're gonna be using it, you should also be using colchicine. But if you're thinking about using prednisone for the treatment of pericarditis, you better call cardiology. Now, I already mentioned that we wanna prevent the inflammation from causing constriction, what are other complications of pericarditis? One of the common ones that I mentioned in the diagnostic criteria for pericarditis is pericardial effusions. The inflammation in pericarditis causes that fluid around the heart not to drain as well, because the lymphatics back up and it can cause a pericardial effusion. The important point to know about the treatment of pericardial effusions in general is that it's not the amount of fluid that necessarily matters, but more importantly, it's how much fluid accumulates over what time period. 
I were to inject one milliliter of fluid into my pericardium every day over a year and get up to 365 milliliters into my pericardium, I'd be able to adapt and I might not even notice it. I mean, besides the fact that you're injecting a syringe of fluid into my pericardium, I wouldn't feel that nearly as much as if you take 365 milliliters and pump it right into my pericardium all at once. So some people who develop a pericardial effusion over time might not even notice it. The good thing about pericardial effusions is that the treatment is the same as for pericarditis. We're gonna give them NSAIDs and colchicine, and often by just decreasing that inflammation, your body's gonna be able to resorb that fluid on its own. Certainly, if a patient goes into cardiac tamponade, which is the heart's inability to pump fluid and causes hemodynamic compromise because there's so much fluid building up and not allowing the heart to expand, if that happens, we certainly need to drain it with a pericardial synthesis or a pericardial window. However, the majority of patients we simply will track outpatient, repeat and echo, and make sure that that fluid around the heart is getting smaller. Sometimes it doesn't and it gets worse and we do end up needing to drain it, but not every patient needs it drained. Now, earlier in the video, I mentioned CRP or C-reactive protein. The reason that I mentioned that is that some studies have shown that following CRP levels outside the hospital can help us with our management. Sometimes some patients require a little bit longer treatment. Some patients can have a little bit shorter. We aim for three months of colchicine, but if we notice that the CRP levels are still elevated, we might extend that out. If it's very low, we might cut it a little bit shorter. Again, it's all about decreasing inflammation and trying to prevent those nasty side effects that can happen with pericarditis, preventing recurrent pericarditis, preventing constrictive pericarditis, and also treating or preventing pericardial effusions in the setting of pericarditis. Now, if you or someone you know has questions about pericarditis, whether you're a medical trainee or a patient or family member, feel free to share this video with them so that you can better understand what's happening when you're diagnosed with pericarditis.